my biggest pleasure here is to introduce our speaker today. He's currently a professor at Princeton University in the religion department. He has also studied and or taught at Chicago, NYU, and Yale, among other places. Her CV confirms that she is a scholar of boundless energy and insight, that she thinks about the narratives of the Hebrew Bible, particularly those concerned with sacrifice and ritual, in a manner that knows how to zoom down to the technicalities of the text and the language, and to zoom out to the larger human practices of ritual and sacrifice. Her 2020 book, The Story of Sacrifice, Ritual and Narrative in the Priestly Source, promises to be something of a prolegomenon to today's talk, entitled Other Stories of Sacrifice, Ritual and Writing in Second Temple Judaism. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Leanne Feldman. Welcome to Toronto, and we look forward to learning and conversing with you today. Thank you so much to the Center for Jewish Studies for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share a bit of the research I've been doing about my as yet untitled next book. Um, I'd initially thought to call it Rewriting Sacrifice in Second Temple Judaism, but by the end of the talk tonight, you'll see why I can no longer do that. Um, Jeremy Skipper joked with me a few months back that I should call my book Other Stories of Sacrifice. Um, I am sorely tempted to do that but for obvious reasons, probably shouldn't, but I definitely borrowed it for my talk tonight. So that's where this is coming from. Um, so what I want to start with tonight has to do with the ways in which scholarly habit has unconsciously shaped and limited scholarly constructions of history. My argument today is a fairly straightforward one but one that has significant implications for how to approach our sources, especially Second Temple sources, if we take it seriously. Put simply, all disciplines have largely unspoken frameworks that function to help scholars organize, categorize, evaluate, and interpret their various data sources. While these frameworks are necessary, they can also be inherently conservative. And what I mean by this is they rarely change unless they're forced to do so. So I first want to start by offering two brief examples of what I'm talking about. The first case is that of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. From our vantage point 75 years later, it seems unfathomable that such a discovery would not be met with an immediate reassessment of the field of ancient Judaism. And yet even six years after their discovery, one of the foremost historians of ancient Judaism at the time, Solomon Zeitlin, asserted that, quote, no great value should be attached to them and they will shed no light on the life of Jews and the pre-Christian period, nor on the literature of that time. As Annette Reed has recently argued, part of the framework with which Zeitlin was operating was one in which the appearance of a certain type of literature, in this case, biblical commentary, was impossible until the rabbinic period. Because these scrolls contained biblical commentary, particularly uh, Pesher Habakkuk, they, they therefore must be from the rabbinic period or later and couldn't possibly be from the second temple period as other scholars thought. Zeitlin's framework for the development of ancient Judaism predetermined how he handled this new evidence. It was simply unthinkable that Jews before the rabbinic period would have composed commentaries. And therefore these scrolls couldn't be as early as some scholars were saying. Now, ultimately, as we know, Zeitlin's perspective did not prevail. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the decades of study that followed did change the framework of the field. So much so, in fact, that Zeitlin's refusal to accept their antiquity is largely forgotten. Even as the field of Second Temple Judaism has reoriented itself, Zeitlin still held fast to the paradigm he developed before their discovery. And while we may shake our heads or laugh in disbelief at the rigidity of Zeitlin when faced with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but his reaction to this newly discovered evidence is not unique. And I would suggest that many of us today have had similar types of blind spots, though perhaps on a seemingly smaller scale. 
So my second example is going to pick on the field of biblical studies a little bit. Um, got an equal opportunity here. Um, so it reaches back to the 8th century BCE. So anyone who has taken an introduction to the Old Testament or a history of ancient Israel course has likely learned that the kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 722 BCE. Indeed, I have turned recited this fact to my own students. It's wrong, though. Thanks to the Assyriologist Chaim Tadmor, we've known since 1958 that the Kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 720 BCE, that there was no two-year-long campaign. Yet I learned about 722 in 2010, and I repeated this to my students in 2020, despite having learned of Tadmor's work from a colleague in 2016. Why? Why did I learn of this only in 2016, and why did I teach something that I know is incorrect? For the record, I no longer teach this. Um, so some of it is expediency. Nearly every introductory textbook in existence, including those published as recently as four years ago, cite this 722 date. Do I want to spend valuable class time contradicting the textbook and explaining what the correct date is and why the textbook says um, should say 720? All for a measly two years? Not particularly. And for the purposes of my lesson that day, the difference of two years doesn't especially matter. So I picked my battles and 722 it is. But what is the textbook? Why does it say 722? And here's the other factor at play, interdisciplinarity. Tadmor was an Assyriologist. His research on this issue was published in the Journal of Cuneiform Studies in 1958. Many biblical scholars are trained to some degree in Assyriology, I certainly was, but how many of us are truly as immersed in that field as we are in the field of Hebrew Bible? How many of us keep up with the most recent issues of every journal in adjacent fields, let alone back issues from nearly 70 years ago? The disciplinary divide between something like biblical studies and Assyriology, or more relevant for my talk tonight, biblical studies and Second Temple Judaism, can lead to a loss of knowledge. This is not the fault of individual scholars, but rather is the result of how systems and fields are constructed. Some of this type of loss of knowledge may be inevitable, and the persistence of pre-existing narratives is to be expected. Unless a wave of scholars repeatedly bring these findings into discussions within biblical studies, the advances of adjacent fields like Assyriology can get lost in the biblical studies discussion. These inaccurate narratives we continue to tell are not the creation or fault of any one scholar. They're quite literally ingrained in the fields themselves. Historian Michel Rolf Truyot has discussed this phenomenon in his description of what he calls thinkable histories. All hysteric historical narratives, according to Truyot, are premised on previous understandings that govern the facts that are retrieved how much weight various pieces of evidence are given, and how the various dots can be connected. So let's go back to Zeitlin here. When presented with new data, the Dead Sea Scrolls, his previous understandings, or what I'm calling his framework, limited his interpretive options. It told him that commentaries were a rabbinic literary form, and thus the only plausible conclusion, the only thinkable conclusion, was that these were post-rabbinic, perhaps, uh, sorry, the only plausible conclusion was that these scrolls had to be post-rabbinic, possible remnants of a medieval Geniza. Even when predict, uh, presented with direct evidence to contradict this, it's not uncommon to persist in these frameworks precisely because they're so deeply ingrained in the field and fixed in our minds through our training. It becomes habit and habits are very hard to break. So what does that have to do with tonight? One of the seemingly unshakable pillars of the study of Second Temple Judaism is the existence of a stable, authoritative written Torah by the end of the Persian period. This Torah is largely thought to resemble something quite similar to what we now know as the Pentateuch. And while scholars continue to, to debate the extent to which the laws and rituals in this Torah were followed in the Second Temple period, the fact of its existence and authority is rarely questioned. Scholars have tended to assume that from the time it's created in the fifth or fourth century BCE, it took up its place at the center of ancient Jewish life, 
texts written after this inevitably take the Pentateuch as their starting point, and whether they agree or disagree, they must contend with its contents and present their perspectives in light, as what, in light of those found in the Pentateuch. This is what John Choi has called a linear model of composition. A scribe takes as their starting point a pre-existing authoritative text and must work creatively within the constraints of that text to interpret and rewrite it to better fit their own context. This is essentially the idea of rewritten Bible. I could offer here at least half a dozen examples from the last decade of scholars who take this conclusion as the starting point for their own analysis. But it's not my aim here to call out individual scholars who take this approach. They're simply working within the established framework of a field, within the realm of what Truyo has called the thinkable, in this case, for the study of Second Temple Judaism. But what I do want to suggest is that it may be time to rethink the thinkable. Over the last 30 years or so, there's been a movement of scholars who have sought to challenge what Bob Kraft called the tyranny of the canonical. There's been a growing recognition of, that the category of canon is largely an anachronistic for the study of Second Temple Judaism. Ancient Jews writing in the Second Temple period would not have had a stable Tanakh, a single set of authorized writing. Works such as Jubilees or First Enoch were found alongside Genesis and Isaiah at Qumran, for example. We know full well that scribes in the Second Temple period we're working with a far more expansive notion of the scriptural than modern scholars might have. Yet even as we come to recognize the varied scriptural landscape in Second Temple Judaism, there remains something of a sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry. So yet even as we come to recognize varied scriptural landscape in Second Temple Judaism, there remains something of a fence around the Torah. There has been more reticence to challenge the canonicity of the Pentateuch in the Second Temple period than to challenge the canon writ large. There are a number of reasons for this reticence around questioning the place of Torah in Second Temple Judaism, ranging from the Persian period date of its compilation to the regular references to Torah or Torah of Moses in Second Temple period texts. Um, to its translation into Greek in the third century BCE, or to the density of citations and allusions to its contents in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yet as scholarship in both Pentateuchal studies and Second Temple Judaism, Judaism has begun to show, the evidence often cited for the dating, stability, and authority of Torah in this period is itself not as secure as it seems. And there's numerous caveats to give for any particular aspect of this argument. Some Pentateuchal scholars, mostly among those in Europe, are now arguing that the editing, framing, and creation of the latest layers of the Pentateuch continued well into the Hellenistic period. Turning to the issue of copying and transmitting an extant pen Pentateuch, Gila Daifani has recently argued that the transmission of the Pentateuch increased substantially only from the second century BCE onwards, indicating a demonstrable shift in the status of the text at that time. Scholars such as Judith Newman have raised questions about the place of the Pentateuch in, Second Temple in the Second Temple period from a different direction, but also one that questions the standard narrative of Persian period stabilization and authorization. Pointing to the fragmentary nature of the Pentateuchal materials among the Qumran scrolls, Newman has suggested that, quote, only the so-called 4Q reworked Pentateuch contains evidence of all five books of the Torah together in one manuscript. So one might ask whether it was in fact reworked from a Pentateuch at all, end quote. Molly Zahn has also turned to the Qumran evidence to raise questions about the status of the Pentateuch. She's rightly pointed to the fact that multiple different forms of books were unproblematically preserved side by side at Qumran, and that, quote, Pentateuch was not accepted from this fluidity, end quote. She argues that even if sources were combined into a single written Pentateuch at a particular point in time, say that Persian period, this does not exempt the text from a continual revision and possibly even parallel revision. As I understand it, the implications of her conclusion are significant. Even if we can conclusively point to a Persian period date for the creation of a written Torah, it's exceedingly unlikely that it was the only extant version of a written Torah. 
it's far more likely that it was one of multiple different textual forms of something referred to as Torah circulating in the Second Temple period. To put it differently, rather than the Pentateuch, perhaps it's time we start considering the possibility of a plurality of Pentateuchs. On some level, this questioning of the literary stability of the Pentateuch is not such a novel idea. Indeed, the idea that the Pentateuch must be understood as a fluid literary category is something that's accepted by many scholars today, at least in theory. The problem arises, though, when a nod to textual fluidity precedes analyses that fundamentally assume relative textual stability and a reasonably linear model of composition. And this is almost always what happens. Fluidity is acknowledged in theory, but the implications of fluidity or plurality do not fundamentally affect the ways in which we go about our analyses of Second Temple period literature. We gain a more nuanced understanding of textual production and proliferation, but our methodologies remain fixed to our inherited framework. In essence, it can be the case that even as we attempt to move past the fence around Torah, we ultimately return to a position behind it and in the process reinscribe a familiar homogenous text. One Pentateuch or many? Why does this matter for the interpretation of Second Temple texts? And to my point today, especially those texts about ritual matters. So the answer to this goes back to the issue of frameworks and the bounds of the thinkable. If we imagine that there's a single authoritative text then it follows that later writings must be interpreting or responding to that text, particularly when it's the legal material in the Pentateuch that forms the cornerstone of arguments for its authority and its central place in this period. Often separated from its narrative context, it's the legal material that's imagined to be the most stable and authoritative. I should mention, of course, that I consider the ritual text to be a subset of legal discourse. When the Pentateuch, and especially its legal parts, are imagined to be authoritative and stable, then the only way to truly understand what these authors of those later texts intend to communicate, and let's set aside the problematic assumptions inherent in the invocation of authorial intent here, um, is to identify how they change or adapt that base text. In this case, almost always something largely similar to the Masoretic text of the Pentateuch. To put it differently, Assuming a stable authoritative Pentateuch at least partially predetermines the ways in which these later texts can be interpreted. But more importantly, it tends to limit the types of questions that are being asked of these texts. When it comes to Second Temple texts about ritual in particular, this tendency becomes even more pronounced. And comparisons to priestly instructions in Exodus or Leviticus, or in the case of the Temple Scroll, those in Deuteronomy, become the baseline for their interpretation. For example, nearly all treatments of the ritual elements of the two texts I'll discuss today, the Aramaic Levi document and Jubilees, uh, take the Pentateuchal priestly materials that discuss blood and sacrifice as their starting point for analysis. And they proceed with kind of an atomistic law by law comparison of these texts. Their conclusions tend to highlight the ways in which these two texts largely assume the sacrificial system described in P while adapting or revising it only slightly or often via a creative exegetical technique. Whether we intend it or not, the frameworks we inherit influence how we approach the interpretation of our data. Even as an increasing number of scholars are starting to realize that the place of the Pentateuch in Second Temple Judaism is not as firmly settled as we may have thought, our methodologies remain anchored to a historical narrative that turns on Persian period canonization and proceeds linearly thereafter. What I want to experiment today is what happens if we put down our Pentateuchs, let go of the BHS and step away from accordance. What happens if we turn to the Second Temple texts to take up issues related to sacrifice, to texts often categorized as rewritten Bible without any assumption of a Bible to rewrite, including the Pentateuch? What can we see in these texts? What kinds of readings can emerge? To preview my conclusions now, I'll suggest that what emerges is a startlingly diverse range of ideas about the function and nature of sacrifice far more diverse than what we have seen when these texts are read through the lens of Torah. 
and especially the sacrificial prescriptions in Leviticus. While the book I'm working on explores this question more broadly across the larger range of texts, today I'm just going to focus on Aramaic Levi and Jubilees and their respective treatments of blood in the sacrificial discourse, which opens a much bigger conversation in each text about the function of the cult. The Aramaic Levi document and Jubilees are two texts that are often discussed together, particularly when it comes to their respective moments of sacrificial discourse. This conflation makes sense if we thought that the texts would emerge from the same community around the same time, yet it's far from clear. Most scholars now date Aramaic Levi to the third century BCE and Jubilees to the second, each text emerging in vastly different sociopolitical contexts. One reason these two texts have been linked is precisely because they both contain detailed sacrificial instructions, some of which overlap both with each other and with sacrificial instructions found in Pentateuchal priestly materials. Once these texts are linked to the Pentateuch and to each other, the impulse is typically to argue for literary dependence or to analyze possible revisions the later text makes to the earlier one. If one text leads to another or rewrites the prior text, usually described in terms of a standardizing impulse. How is the proper form of ritual practice being changed? Such readings often lead to an analysis that focuses only on the procedural while marginalizing the ways in which those procedures speak to underlying ideology. Perhaps more importantly, this linear comparative approach to the analysis of these texts tends to assume the ideology of the base text as its starting point. The worldview of the earliest text is imported into the next one, perhaps being lightly revised, but never being, outright, never being outright rejected or contradicted. Let me put it a bit more concretely and turn to the specific example I want to discuss today, blood. Most analyses of Aramaic Levi and Jubilees assume that what the Pentateuch, and especially P, says about blood should be the starting point for analyzing what Aramaic Levi and Jubilee, Jubilee say about blood. In this case, Genesis 9 through 9 verses 4 through 6 become a critical base text that's interpreted by each of these later authors in slightly different ways. But the essential function and ideology of blood and bloodshed presented in Genesis 9 is always assumed. And what I want to show today is that when they are analyzed on their own terms without taking Genesis 9 or any Pentateuchal material as a starting point, the treatment of blood in these texts is remarkably different and reveals two nearly opposite ideas about why the cult exists in the first place. This is a question that doesn't typically get asked um, would we only compare these texts to Leviticus, precisely, precisely because we unconsciously assume they adopt the priestly perspective on why the cult exists. In what follows, I'll first look at each of these texts independently, and only after that will I compare what ideas of blood reveal in these two texts. Sorry about that. That's Genesis 9, 4 through 6. So show it up there. Blood in the Aramaic Levi document is something that is consistently below the surface and almost never in full view. There's two different ways that I want to discuss the presence and absence of blood in Aramaic Levi tonight. The first is with respect to the broader narrative frame of the document, and the second is within the sacrificial instructions themselves. While there are two different issues, the first bloodshed and the second blood manipulation, reading these two discourses about blood together reveals a kind of squeamishness within this text. The narrative frame of Aramaic Levi is a matter of debate. Like many ancient manuscripts, this one was not recovered in a single undamaged scroll. It exists in multiple fragments, sometimes across two different languages, Aramaic and Greek. And as any literary theorist knows, where a story begins is often incredibly important for its interpretation. And so it is with Aramaic Levi. And unfortunately, we can't be entirely sure where the story begins. For the purposes of this talk, I will follow the order suggested by Greenfield, Stone, and Eschel in their edition. And in this version, Aramaic Levi begins with the story of the rape of Dina and the revenge of her brothers, that the revenge that her brothers exact against the Shechemites. None of the extant fragments actually narrate the slaughter 
But at the end of the document, Levi reflects on his life and says, I was 18 when I killed Shechem and, the, and destroyed the workers of violence. This version of Aramaic Levi begins with bloodshed, yet there's never explicit mention of blood in any of the extant fragments of the first two columns. We're left to infer the bloody seed, hinted at only in Levi's comment in the aftermath that he laundered his clothes to purify them and washed his body in water to make his path straight. Violence followed by this action implies that bloodshed renders something impure. It causes one to deviate from desirable behavior. In both cases, bloodshed seems to point towards something that's unnatural and undesirable, something that challenges the way things are meant to be. Next, in the section of Aramaic Levi, often called the law of the priesthood, Isaac instructs his grandson Levi in the rules of offering sacrifices. Other descriptions of sacrifice that we have, both from the Pentateuch and other Second Temple writings, present the sanctuary, or at least the sacrificial altar, as a wash in blood. Blood's tossed on top, on the sides, poured out on the ground, all around the altar. Uh, sacrifices, to put it somewhat colloquially, a bloody mess. But this is not the case in Aramaic Levi. In fact, this text draws a very different picture. Just as Levi is said to wash his garments and his body after the, sl the slaughter of the Shechemites in this text narrative frame, he's also instructed to wash his hands and feet four different times over the course of offering a sacrifice, after dressing, after slaughtering the animal, after dashing its blood, and before leaving the sanctuary. The latter three of these instances are explicitly linked with a concern for the presence of blood on Levi's body. The washing of hands and feet in particular is of note here, in part because these are the bodily extremities that mediate touch and thus that come into direct contact with blood. The potential for Levi to transfer blood from his body to another location is mitigated by this repeated washing, which serves to contain the substance to a restricted area. In essence, while blood is a necessary byproduct of slaughtering an animal for sacrifice, the way a priest is instructed to handle it suggests that contact with it should be avoided as much as possible. But what's he supposed to do with the blood of the animal once it's been shed? The most common thing to do in ancient Israelite and Jewish sacrifice is to put the blood on the altar. As Jacob Milgram argued at length in the 90s, ancient Israelites imagined blood to be a ritual detergent that cleans up impurities that have contaminated the sanctuary and its altar. Priests would put blood on top of the altar and specifically on its horns in order to purify the sanctuary. Typically, scholars have interpreted the blood manipulation in Aramaic Levi along these lines, in part due to an assumption that it's rewriting parts of Leviticus. But there's two points worth highlighting here. Nowhere in this text does it describe the altar as having horns. And given the archaeological finds in the Second Temple period, we need not assume that all altars had horns. And two, the blood in this text is never actually put on top of the altar. Quite to the contrary, in fact. First, the animal is butchered and salted thoroughly, presumably to dry it out and remove as much of the residual blood as possible. But the animal's head cannot be successfully salted. And the text has an ingenious solution for this. When the head is put on the altar, it's treated unlike any of the other butchered portions. It's placed under a layer of fat. This effectively hides any residual blood from sight. And finally, the remainder of the blood is tossed on the sides of the altar, but never on top. Why does the distinction matter? I'd suggest for two reasons. It provides a strong hint as to whose perspective is being centered here and who is most averse to the sight of blood. And two, it suggests that the use of blood as described in Aramaic Levi might not be related to purification or ritual cleaning at all. The perspective being centered here is that of God, who in this text is repeatedly imagined as residing in the heavens. The concern for hiding the blood from the animal's head, putting the blood only on vertical surfaces and not on horizontal ones, and preventing cross-contamination from priests' physical movements in the sanctuary all point to the construction of a bloodless God's eye view. Blood put on the sides of the altar might be able to be seen by humans, but it remains invisible to someone looking down on the altar from above. 
The question of purification is related. If God cannot see the blood, and is indeed imagined as not wanting to see the blood, this suggests that the function of the blood is not for his benefit. And nowhere in Aramaic Levi does it say that sacrifice affects purification. Quite to the contrary, impurity and the process of purification seems to be restricted to the individual and is dealt with by laundering clothes and bathing, just as Levi did after the Shechemite episode and as he does multiple times in the sanctuary. Blood and bloodshed might render an individual impure, but sacrifice is nowhere conceived of as part of the process of purification. The situation in the Book of Jubilees is quite different. A story covering the creation of the world up to God's revelation at Mount Sinai, the world of Jubilees is a world awash in blood. Many scholars have seen the impetus for the flood in this text as widespread bloodshed among living creatures, angelic, human, and animal. James Kugel, for example, has argued that the function of the floodwaters is to wash away the blood on the earth and to purify it. But there's no indication anywhere in the Book of Jubilees that water has a purificatory function. Instead, in Jubilees, what purifies or atones for bloodshed is blood itself. Immediately after the flood, Noah offers a goat and, quote, atoned with its blood for all the sins of the earth, end quote. This is a strong indication in Jubilees that purification and atonement is not affected by water, because if the waters of the flood were enough to purify the earth from its sins, this sacrifice wouldn't have been necessary in the first place. Noah's sacrifice is made up of several animals and seems to serve multiple different functions, but the only explicit mention of blood in the sacrificial sequence is with respect to this atoning function. Blood in Jubilees may affect atonement and purification, quite distinct from the ideology in Aramaic Levi, but it's not its only function. As part of a covenant making with the people, the narrator describes blood being sprinkled on the people, but there's no indication there that this is for atonement. Something else is going on. Elsewhere in Jubilees, Abraham is said to pour out blood over an offering while asking for a divine vision and it's later used by the Israelites to ward off the slaughtering forces who were sent to kill every firstborn in Egypt. What do covenant making, divination, protection, and atonement have in common? In each case, blood marks something as belonging to God in some way. In the case of covenant making, the sprinkling of blood on the people physically marks the agreement they've entered into. In the case of Abraham's divination, it establishes his subsequent dream as a divine vision. And the Israelite homes are smeared with blood in Egypt precisely to mark them as belonging to God and to spare them from being slaughtered. But how is atonement related to this? Answering that requires an understanding of the construction of human nature in the post diluvian world of Jubilees. After the flood, God establishes two rules for humans in order to curb their violent tendencies. One is that they cannot eat blood. And the other is that anyone who sheds human blood must pay with his own blood. Instituting talionic punishment for human bloodshed should in theory reduce the likelihood of humans to shed each other's blood. The motivation for the law against the consumption of blood on the other hand is presented as having a direct link with its sacrificial use. Humans can't eat blood because they need it to make atonement on the altar. In the sacrificial ideology developed in Jubilees, it's animal blood that makes atonement, and atonement must be made every morning and evening. Why so frequently? I'd suggest that it's because God knows that humans will not follow his rules. They will kill each other, and they will consume blood. And this happens over and over again in the story of Jubilees. If human beings regularly break the very rules that God asked them to keep, there needs to be a way for them to atone for those sins. Otherwise, the stage is set for a repeat of the flood. And this is where the use of blood for atonement comes in. On a community-wide scale, God knows God notes in the little apocalypse in chapter 23 that a broken covenant cannot be renewed without bloodshed. 
and so too on an individual level. Humans require constant atonement. And in the world of Jubilees, a transactional type of theology is being constructed, one in which God is the keeper of the ledger. Human blood for human blood in the case of murder, animal blood for animal blood in the case of its consumption. And if you break the rules set out by God, and you will break those rules, then you must atone for that by giving blood back to God on the altar. Constant atonement with blood on the altar becomes a way to mark the ongoing covenantal relationship between God and Israel. So long as Israel keeps the ledger balanced, the covenant will remain intact. The threat is that this ledger should fall out of balance. It will lead to widespread impurity in the land and to human beings once again being uprooted from it. The purpose of sacrifice in Jubilees, at least in part, is to help prevent this outcome and to foreclose any divine need for another flood. But more broadly speaking, blood in Jubilees marks something as belonging to God. If you take blood, then you must repay with blood. Jubilees is a text that then answers blood with more blood, expressed in Talionic laws about murder, but also in its conception of the function of bloody sacrifice. By setting aside the interpretive framework imposed by the centralization narrative and the reading of Torah, I have approached the analysis of these two texts from a new angle. Looking at their respective representations of blood has allowed me to explore their distinct ideas about the function of cult and the reason for its existence. These are precisely the types of questions that reading linearly uh, through a lens of Torah can obscure particularly when the focal point of analysis is the standardization of ritual practice. Rather than assuming the inevitable importance of a standardized cult, these texts each make an argument for its very existence. And indeed, they make two very different arguments. Aramaic Levi and Jubilees truly could not present a more stark contrast when it comes to the issue of blood. I've gathered the different elements here in a table and want to offer one possible comparative reading of these texts. So in each case, the details of sacrificial procedure are important. Where and how blood is used reveals something about e what each text thinks about the nature of human beings, the desires of God, and the function of sacrifice and the cult. Aramaic Levi's world is clean, controlled, and as bloodless as possible. This text focus on hiding the blood from God's sight perhaps suggests that the God of this text is one that's not fully comfortable with the idea of violence. Indeed, even in the case of the much lauded violence of Levi towards the Shechemites, he first had to get the permission of God to carry it out. Violence in Aramaic Levi is not imagined as the norm. The world is presented in a much more idealized way in a way that focuses specifically on the realm of the sanctuary. While this is arguably the bloodiest place in the world with its constant daily slaughter and sacrifice, that blood is kept away from divine sight as much as possible. In Jubilees, on the other hand, God lacks complete control of humanity and is imagined as recognizing and accepting that the world is a bloody one. While attempting to curb the bloodshed to some degree, this God also understands that bloodlessness is impossible. So instead, this God embraces blood and uses it to mark the things that belong to him, or perhaps more broadly, to the realm of the sacred. In this way, blood in Jubilees becomes a very visible substance, one that God must continually see in order to maintain the covenant with his people. While the function of the cult in Aramaic Levi seems to be to create a divine oasis away from the kingdom of a sword, the cult in Jubilees provides the means of atonement for the inherently disobedient Israelites to maintain their covenantal relationship with God. To put it somewhat differently, in Aramaic Levi, sacrifice is for the pleasure of God, while in Jubilees, it's for the benefit of the people. I want to shift now to some conclusions and preliminary thoughts about what is about possible ways forward with this kind of project. And there's three concluding points that I want to make here. The first of these can be summed up by put down the pentateuch. 
when we take seriously the idea of textual fluidity in the Second Temple period, including the idea of Pentateuchal fluidity, I would suggest that it's imperative that we do not treat the MT or Septuagint as a base text. Do I mean to suggest that a text like Jubilees had no knowledge at all of any of the materials in, that are found in what we now call Genesis? No, of course not. Such a claim would be indefensible. However, what I want to push for here is caution and restraint, and to join a growing chorus of scholars who insist that we rethink the idea of rewriting and resist straightforward linear models of composition. Does Jubilee show an awareness of some of the stories we know from MT Genesis? Yes. Does this mean that the authors had a copy of Genesis as we now know it in front of them or even memorized? Not necessarily. And even if they did, why should we assume that they considered it authoritative? Scholars in both Pentateuchal studies and Second Temple Judaism have long been pushing back against the presumption that rewriting a text means the base text holds some kind of authority for the later author. Whether this is found in the work of Pentateuchal scholars like Jeffrey Stafford and Joel Baden, who reject the idea that Deuteronomy sees the Covenant Code as authoritative when it reuses it, or a Second Temple Judaism scholar like Molly Zahn, who's pushed for a departure from the language of rewriting to describe processes of textual production more accurately, paradigms are shifting across multiple fields. This coupled with the undeniable evidence for literary fluidity of Pentateuch in the Second Temple period means that we must acknowledge that we can't always know exactly what, if anything, these authors were working from or what value they assigned to the text that they may have reused. It means stepping away from adherence to linear models of composition. This brings me to my second point. Many interpretations of Second Temple texts have been conditioned by the assumption of a stable authoritative Pentateuch as their base text and by these linear models of composition. Reading Aramaic Levi's Law of the Priesthood against the Pentateuch, for example, necessarily imports the world of the latter into the former. The ideas of cult, sacrifice, and blood from the Pentateuch, in this case P, are simply assumed to be the framework for discussions of sacrifice in Aramaic Levi. When one of these texts describe a sacrificial procedure, for example, the question becomes, well, which of P's sacrifices is it? Is it a whole burnt offering? Is it a well-being offering? Is it a purification offering? This type of analysis artificially limits the way these texts are read. It obscures the idiosyncratic approaches of each of these texts to sacrificial discourse and artificially flattens an otherwise diverse array of sacrificial ideologies in the Second Temple period. This raises an important methodological issue that I might have spent a little bit of time thinking about. When sacrificial instructions, like laws more generally, are removed from their narr narrative context and then analyzed on a law-by-law -law basis, it's typically because scholars are assuming a kind of historical praxis. But there's no clear evidence that any of these laws or ritual instructions in the Pentateuch were ever carried out as they were described. And as I've argued at length elsewhere, Here's where this is the follow up on the first book. Um, they are a literary representation of sacrifice that helped to construct a specific worldview in a story aimed at constructing a foundation myth for the Israelite cult. Textualized and narrativized sacrificial instructions operate within their own specific framework, their own set of structures for making sense of the world and explaining its parts. Methodologically speaking, what holds for Second Temple literature, removing sacrificial instructions from their narrative framework and analyzing them apart from the world they're helping to construct, can and does distort their interpretation. It also implicitly assumes a relationship to historical practice they may not actually possess. To put it simply, textual representations of ritual first must be interpreted within their own literary context especially if we then want to use those texts to make any kind of historical claim. And I'll turn now to my final point and return to how I began this talk with a discussion of scholarly habit. It's no secret that scholars are often uncomfortable with delving into the messy details of sacrifice, of imagining the possibility that treatment of blood could convey worldviews. We're by nature, maybe a bit like Aramaic Levi, somewhat squeamish about this kind of thing. 
It's another part of the framework we operate within. For most of us, the practicalities of slaughter are not part of our daily lives. Meat exists neatly packaged in the grocery store. But that squeamishness can be mitigated by leaning into the textual nature of our sources, by pursuing atomistic comparisons of procedure. In short, by shifting from the realm of imagined practice to the realm of textual exegesis. This shifts the conversation from the altar to the page. This model of a textual exegesis both presumes a base text to exegete and reinforces a particular approach to textualized sacrificial instructions. But it remains so prevalent in part because it is on the page where scholars feel the most comfortable with sacrifice. The page, after all, is clean and bloodless. So even though we might know better than to assume a stable authoritative Pentateuch as a base text, it's habit to return to it. We need frameworks within which to operate. And this is precisely what allows us to make sense of the data in front of us. But it's equally true that sometimes those frameworks need to change, especially as evidence mounts that they're not entirely correct. And in this case, I would suggest that evidence is mounting against the positioning of a single, stable, authoritative Persian area, era Pentateuch that functions as one foundation of Second Temple Judaism. It's time to take this evidence and its implications seriously, to recognize how the habits of how the habits ingrained in us have affected our analyses of the data, and to shift our frameworks for the study of Second Temple Judaism accordingly. Remember Zeitlin.